All right. Hi, everybody. This is Matthew Troy. I'm the music director and conductor for the Western Piedmont Symphony. So excited to be joined today by my friend and colleague, Dan Pertu, uh, who is writing a wonderful piece that's going to be world premiered at our closing masterworks of our season coming up next week. So, Dan, I'm so excited to chat with you today and dive into a little bit uh, about this piece. Sure. Happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about yourself uh, to get started, maybe. How did you become a composer? You know, I know as a conductor, people often say, how do you even become a conductor? And I'm sure you must certainly get that question often as well. Sure. Um, so I, I loved composing ever since I was really young. I started piano when I was five. And so um, as I was working on piano music, I um, got, always had this feeling, especially and when I was around seven or eight, I was like, you know, I wish I could make up my own stuff and I would start making it up. Um, but I really didn't know what I was doing until I learned um, music theory. And I learned that and I did more sophisticated stuff as I went through school, but finally decided, you know, I had a lot of other interests and stuff, but I finally decided in college um, and graduate school, you know, that's ultimately what I wanted to do. And so that's how I got on the road and then um, have been doing um, more and more orchestral composition, uh, which I've been very excited about. And I also love, um, in particular, I love writing music that includes um, stuff that is um, relevant to local audiences. And so that's part of how this particular piece came about, too. Yeah. So you and I met uh, last summer, I suppose it was, or was it two summers ago? Two summers ago out in Los Angeles at the League of American Orchestras conference. And I, you know, had been hearing your name more and more prior to the conference. And it seems like you are just, you know, really having a great time right now. I mean, you're writing a lot of music. You're having your works premiered and performed by a lot of different orchestras. Um, that That must be a thrilling experience for you, because I know every time you you write a piece, it's almost like maybe something akin to giving birth to a new baby, you know? <laughs> and so to see that baby get out and, and start living in the world of orchestras, it's got to be a thrill. Yeah. So it's been a really, really exciting um, season right now for me. And uh, that is absolutely true. I mean, you, you want your, each composition is like a child and you want it to have its own life. Um, I've been, uh, fortunate in that I've also been collaborating with people who believe in the music and, you know, it depends on, uh, the people, uh, who are bringing it to life, whether it's you with Western Piedmont or, um, whether it's with, um, you know, a collaborator, a soloist who's doing a concerto or a different orchestra. Um, it's, it really is a collaborative effort. It's not, you know, I can write all the notes I want, but, you know, I still have to have humans play it. And that's the best part of it, um, is, is the performance and going there and getting the thrill of it and, um, connecting with the audience as well. Um, audience members, well, I, I love talking with them and I love, um, seeing how they react to the piece and, um, you know, and, and getting to know the different communities I go to. Sure. So, you know, as we explore this topic of new music, um, new music might in some ways be something that an audience has a little bit of, you know, they're, they're unsure how to feel about new music sometimes. So how would you describe your music? I mean, I certainly can speak to a little bit of what, what I was drawn to in your music um, and the, the reasons that we decided to connect and, and embark on this 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 collaboration, this commission for the Western Piedmont Symphony. Um, but tell us a little bit about just how you would describe your style. What is important to you as a composer, um, and how you how you approach some of the very beginning stages of of a new work. Sure. So one of the things I love to do is I love to tell stories through music. Uh, I think that's really what people connect with. And there's always a new story to be told. Um, I'm of the mindset that I like to tell my stories in a language that audience members can understand. So um, some, some composers uh, in the past have sort of reinvented the language and 
um, that's fine. And, you know, that's an exciting thing for them to do. But sometimes that can be hard to understand if you don't know it. Um, so I, I like to tell it in a story that people understand, but you can still have a completely new story in that language. Um, so, um, one of the things I, one of the ways I would characterize it, I think is, um, maybe neo-romantic. Um, so there are aspects that are, um, from the romantic era. Um, it's very melodic and harmonically driven, but, um, it's not a reinvention of Brahms or Beethoven. Uh, it's um, my approach to harmony and um, also timbral writing, like instrument tone colors and that kind of stuff. That's much more informed by the 20th and 21st century. So, um, so it's a mixture of the two. You know, you you blend the um, the present day with elements of the past and then tell a new story, but still tell it in a language that people understand. That's, that's what I try to do anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really good description of, of your music because I, I would tend to agree that when I was exploring your music more, that neo-romantic uh, term I think is a really apt description just because of what you said in terms of having certain elements that might be from that romantic period, but definitely in a new way. I think your music has an incredibly... Uh, fresh, kind of bright, crisp sound to it. So I think some of the more modern orchestrational techniques um, come through very well in your music. Um, so I, I think, yeah, that's that's certainly um, very relatable, and I think it's something that connects with an audience very well. Um, and, I, and I have no doubt that this uh, piece, when we premiere Appalachian Vistas, that this will uh, as what happened in that piece as well. So when you're starting a new piece when you're, you know, like I said, at the beginning stages of writing something, are you, are you thinking more about melody or harmony or are you thinking even bigger picture, like structure of the piece and layout the form and design of the piece? Um, what are some of those things that in that very early stage that kind of get the spark, you know, to start burning more brightly? Yeah. So for me, when we were talking about this piece, um, uh, I, I started with the folk tunes, the Appalachian folk tunes, and um, I chose them specifically to be tunes from that were commonly sung in North Carolina, uh, even though there are lots of, you know, Appalachia is a big region. <laughs> yes, it is. So, so uh, I, I wanted to choose tunes that were sung specifically in North Carolina. And uh, I did my research there. And then I, I started with the tunes. And then I harmonized them in certain ways um, that the tunes suggested. Um, a good amount of the harmonies uh, in this piece are informed by the modes, um, the folk tune modes. And um, so then I, you know, I started with the tunes, but then I, I would break them up and I would think about, okay, how can I... Um, convey this tune, but then, um, you know, take snippets of it, take motives of it, develop it, um, make it into something that's a bigger piece. And so then I start with the tunes, I start with the ideas, and then it's a process of um, thinking also of how do they start to fit into a larger form. So the first tune, which is Come All You Fair and Tender Ladies, that one is sort of like the intro um, or the first section of this piece, of this tone poem. And then uh, the second tune would be the basis, the second tune, which is uh, Young Hunting, and that would be the basis for the, um, the B section, if you will. And then um, I like to you know, bring back different sections and link back to what you heard before. Because if you do, if you throw too much new stuff at a, a listener, the listener is just going to be confused. It's like, what's going on? This is random. So, so then I brought back uh, Come All You Fair and Tender Ladies. And then for more variety, brought in a new tune again called The Golden Vanity. And so I have a total of three tunes that is based on. And um, then I, you know, I thought about the different proportions of it too. As I compose, I think about, okay, how long is this section going to be? And how long is this next section going to be? And I have to balance that as well. And is it 
the right time for the next section and you build your climaxes. And so it is, you know, it's on the micro level and then it's on the big picture level. You have to think about all that. And that's why I love composition because it's such a complex and integrated process. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. Um, so if you don't mind, would you tell us just a little bit about what stood out to you in particular about these three tunes? I mean, obviously, like you said, there, there's such a rich tradition in our region, um, of folk music and, um, that has just fascinating roots, even if you trace that folk music back deeply into the past. So, um, it must've been somewhat of a challenge to select, you know, tunes out of out of this kind of almost endless number of tunes that you could have chosen from but there 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 must have been something that stood out to you about these these tunes and, yeah. and could you maybe just share a little bit about what caught your ear and what caught your imagination as you uh were choosing these tunes absolutely um couple things a lot of these tunes come i think all three of these tunes originally come from the british isles possibly scots scottish or irish um and um, so, and also on a more personal note, I just so happen to uh, accompany my wife. I'm I'm uh, her pianist, and she's also a U.S. National Scottish Fiddling Champion. Oh, um, wow. amazing! Yeah, and and also she's a violin professor and plays violin in orchestras around here. But she has the Scottish fiddling side. And we have we frequently um, go on performances in the summer, and uh, in the past have performed in North Carolina and also in um, Virginia. And she's performing in Virginia in a few weeks. Um, so when we select um, tunes as a duo, we're looking for ones that. Some of these tunes are so soulful and so beautiful and uh, rich and emotional. And so I try to choose ones that have, um, you know, sort of a really beautiful melodic and harmonic content to them. Um, some of them can be pretty songs, but they just don't have much. You know, it's just sort of they don't stand out. You know, like with anything, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so I tried to pick ones like the first one, Come All You Fair and Tender Ladies. That one has um, that sort of pentatonic quality to it. And it's based on a five note scale, the pentatonic, uh, standard pentatonic scale. And uh, that scale is actually the oldest scale that we have musical evidence of. Um, there are bone flutes made 40,000 years ago in Europe that were tuned to that scale, which is really, really ancient. And you and find so that I, scale all over the world, too, right? Yeah. There are various different cultures, so it's something kind of just elemental to, to us as humans making music. It, it Totally. I mean, it's all over in Chinese music. Yes, and right. it's all over in... Um, you know, various others. So, um, yeah, so I love that. And then, so I chose that one because it has that sort of wonderful quality to it. And it's ancient sounding. The second one, which is Young Hunting, um, it goes like this. Now, that one is great because it's in... Um, it's in a sort of Aeolian mode, which is music theory speak for sort of an old, you know, an old scale. And, um, and it has that, um, again, that quality to it, that it sounds sort of not of this time. It sounds of an older time, yeah. but yet, um, it's something can be brought to life. And, um, what all of these tunes, interestingly, were also brought to life, not just, of course, in Appalachia, but by various folk singers in the 50s, 60s, 70s, or whatever. Yeah. And so people may recognize them from uh, folk, folk and rock singers as well. And they love some of those um, old modes and, and some of that with the 
you know, I don't want to get too music theory. Yeah, into sure. It, but they love some of that. And so well, it's a mixture when, of the old and the new. I think what you're saying, yeah, almost there's a kind of a little bit of minor, a little bit of major feel. So it has a, almost like a medieval like quality to it in a way, just to yeah. put it in more in layman's terms, I suppose. Exactly. So, and then the last tune is called The Golden Vanity, which is, um, I mean, <laughs> the content of these tunes is quite funny, <laughs> some of them, because they're really quite awful and violent, the lyrics. Um, they, <laughs> um, so, you know, like um, the young hunting, I mean, he ends up dead at the end or something because, you know, so it's just awful. But um, The Golden Vanity is another one. It's... Um, And again, it has that, what key are we really in? And it sort of slips in and out of it and um, has, and it all, also these tunes are like in terms of meter and rhythm, they're flexible because of the singers and, um, you know, the different performance traditions. So all of them seem to be like a really fertile ground for um, turning it into a, an orchestra piece. Yeah, they're malleable. They can be shaped in one way or another way, depending on the interpretation or, like you said, different ideas that kind of naturally come out of the music that inspire you to go in one direction or another. So that, that, that really, I think, makes sense and it helps us understand how a composer can take that, that seed of an idea and then build a, a bigger piece for an entire orchestra out of it. So that's a fascinating topic to explore with you a little bit. Um, is there anything other than these tunes in particular that you think the audience, you know, I think sometimes world premieres are, are, are hard because um, the audience only gets one hearing of it and they're supposed to, to kind of digest this, you know, in one hearing um, yeah. at the performance. Whereas, you know, if you've heard a Beethoven symphony, we've had the, the benefit of hearing it many, many times over and over again in different contexts, but what, what do you think the audience should really listen to, um, and 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 what do you think will grab their their attention? Couple things. Uh, one, I think if people know Aaron Copland's music, um, they know Appalachian Spring or Appalachian Spring, or they might know um, Rodeo. Yep. Um, both of the, you know, those. The, this might remind them a little bit of that. Um, there are parts that might sound like a soundtrack to, um, an old West story or something, just because of these tunes that are used, you know, Rodeo used some of those old tunes, which actually came from Scotland. Right. Um, but, um, so I would, you know, just to anchor the listening experience, um, I would say, you know, again, listen for the tunes, but also listen for, um, just the the different uh, where the melodies are coming, you know, they're going to be coming in. They're going to be coming in the trumpets. They're going to be coming in the horns, the French horns, or maybe in the woodwinds um, or the strings. And you know, it's going to be thrown around in different parts of the orchestra. Um, but there's a good amount, I think, of repetition. So it may appear in one family at one point, but it'll, then it'll appear in another family. And you can sort of latch on to the different um, sounds and different melodies in the different families. And, you know, I'd also listen for um, the, the different sections and it starts off a little grander, but, you know, it, it moves along. But then toward the end, it, it gets really energetic and gets really fast yeah. and exciting. So, uh, you know, just, uh, hold on <laughs> and you enjoy the ride, enjoy the ride, enjoy to, the ride. To, uh, to the end. That's right. That's a, that's a great thing. And I'm really thrilled, you know, that you will be able to be here with us, with the orchestra during some of our rehearsal process. You'll be able to be here in person yeah. at the performance to meet the orchestra, but also to be there, meet, uh, our audience members, so uh, if you're watching this video, I encourage you to come to the concert, make sure you come to the concert, um, but also you'll have a chance to speak with Dan uh, at some point, either after the concert or post-concert reception or, or some other uh, opportunity when he's around. So that's, that's a really um, just important piece, and I'm thrilled that you'll be able to join us here for that. Um, 
just one final question before we close. Um, you know, I feel like in today's world, there is so much music. <laughs> People have so much access to music. Um, and and uh, the way we consume music and the way we experience music, you know, has been fractured in so many ways. People get music from so many different places, depending on what their interests are. Um, why, why to a, a, an average audience member, why does new music like this matter? Why does uh, having orchestras that commission um, new works, in addition to the fact that, you know, it helps keep composers like yourself employed, which is always a good thing, but why does... Why does new music matter, um, and, and why is this important for the mission of orchestras and just the arts in general? Now that's, a, that's a wonderful question. I love the question. Um, one of, I think one of the best answers I've heard to that question, it's not my answer, actually, but I heard it, was um, you don't want to, you know, in 2400, do you want to look back 300 years and then say, well, nothing happened in the 21st century? <laughs> um, you know, we have, there's culture, there's music in a whole centuries, um, all time since for, well, for 40,000 years, but, you know, at least written music since um, in Europe, since around 1000 AD. Um, and we've got to, we've got to keep doing it. Um, so, and then the other question is why orchestra? Well, um, the orchestra is such a wonderful, um, versatile ensemble. So on the one hand, uh, we have such a plethora of great genres, right? So, you know, we mentioned, I mentioned rock, I mentioned folk music, I mentioned, um, very, you know, chamber music, whatever. We have a lot of, and then world music, non-Western music, we have a lot of different styles out there. Um, but orchestral music is still such an important and such uh, an interesting um, enterprise. And, you know, it involves so many people. Um, you know, you have 50 to 150 <laughs> musicians on the stage, depending on um, what is called for. So you have this huge amount of people involved already there. They're all extremely highly trained. Um, and, um, you know, in, and so you have this production of an incredible art form um, that is very unique unto itself. And so you have the question of why is it important in terms of, you know, music of our time, but then you have orchestras that are doing amazing things. And so it's an experience ultimately like nothing else. And so I think I'm just passionate about contributing, being one person who can continue to contribute to that as a composer, um, you know, because I think, um, as I said, it's an experience like nothing else. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. And I, I certainly echo that statement. I know as a conductor, you know, the thrill really comes from all of these amazing musicians working together towards a common goal. Um, a lot of different viewpoints, a lot of different opinions, you know, but we're working uh, in one direction, trying to create the best concert, the best experience possible, trying to be as true to the composer's intentions as we can possibly be. Um, and so there is something really unique and special and beautiful about that. And I think kind of a broader lesson for all of us in the world today about how to uh, work through our differences, work together to create something beautiful. So um, just really, Dan, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. The concert is coming up on May 16th, 7.30 p.m. P.E. Monroe Auditorium here in Hickory, North Carolina. You can get tickets and more information at wpsymphony.org. Um, and Dan, just thank you so much for your time. And I am absolutely thrilled to bring this piece to life with you uh, next week. So thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Thanks. We'll see you there.